أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم من نفخه ونفخه وحمزه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيد السادات دليل الخيرات سيد الأولين والآخرين إمام الأولياء والمتقين سيد الأبرار وزين المرسلين الأخيار فأكرم من أظلم عليه الليل وأشرف عليه النهار رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي اوزعني ان اشكر نعمتك التي انعمت علي وعلى والدي وان اعمل صالحا ترضاه واصلح لي في ذريتي اني تبت اليك واني من المسلمين وبعد So first of all I I actually when I came today I thought we were only going to be like three that's me and the two organizers and maybe him just to do the video and make it you know I thought I, I was preparing for like you know sounds just to play from the internet to say hey you know just to make it seem as if there were people here so um, in Islam as you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us based on what we strive for that human beings will not have anything other than what they strive for um, for those of you who this is your first time coming and you managed to come in the rain, Allah is Shakur. For those of you who have come now for three weeks in a row and still the rain did not deter you, I actually thought there was going to be a World Cup match as well at this time, but luckily for you guys, you didn't have the dilemma of choosing between that. Um, but in any case, may Allah reward you all for coming. May Allah at least let you leave with all your sins forgiven and make you attain beyond what many people would have attained in a gathering like this. Um, I really, while I was preparing for this, I, I had a huge, um, I had a huge, I had a thought basically, that there is a big trap that listening to stories like this can cause. Um, and this kind of trap, you have to be really introspective to be able to observe and not fall into it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he tells us stories of events in the Qur'an, he said, لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ So that we may strengthen and firmen your heart. That's what he said to Prophet Muhammad We tell you all these stories to firm his heart. His heart was already pure. And his heart already had a goal. That was Allah alone. Hence, these stories, there was no danger of him listening to it and wanting anything other than Allah. There's a huge danger of listening to the success stories of righteous people and aiming as a result of listening to their stories, aiming for what God gave them for their deeds, rather than aiming for their deeds. What does that mean? When we read the story of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas, and we saw that he ended up having millions of followers, not exaggerating, millions. There's a trap of listening to a story like that and go, if I do this, I might also get millions of followers. Whereas if Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz had thought of getting millions of followers, he wouldn't have been given what Allah gave him. When we learned about Sheikh Ahmed Ubambo, right, Sheikh Ahmed Ubambo last week, and you saw that millions of people till date recite his Qasida, there's a trap of listening to some story like that and go, if I do what they did, I will get what Allah gave them. Whereas these people never, ever had in their goal or in their sight the gifts that Allah gave them for their service to Him. All they were focused on was just serving Allah. There are so many friends of Allah that you will never hear of. Yet, on the Day of Judgment, they will be like stars, they will be like moons, they will be like suns. Okay? That it's only on the Day of Judgment that you hear about them. So please do not fall into the trap of hearing success stories of God's friends and aiming for the same success they had without doing the same work they've done. Even if you, in fact, if it's even a trap when you aim for what Allah gave them and because when you do what they've done so that you can get what Allah gave them. Do you understand that? Because is Allah not sufficient? As Allah said in the Quran, Allah bikafin abda? Is Allah not enough for his servant? Is Allah as a goal not enough for you? 
So this is so important because we're going to listen to another amazing success story. Someone who we're still speaking about hundreds of years after she passed away. Right? But there's a trap which I really am asking Allah not to let any of us fall into. That we listen to their amazing stories and somehow in trying to imitate them, we seek or we yearn or we hope for what Allah has given them. What Allah has given them is Allah's choice. It may be that if Allah gave you one-tenth of the fame she gave her, you'd be destroyed. Literally. It may be that if Allah gave you half of the money he gave Mansa Musa, you'd be in jail. Right? Or you'd be dead. So Allah, he's a razik, he's the provider. He knows what he needs to give all of his servants. So please do not fall into the trap of listening to these amazing stories and somehow yearning for what Allah gave them. Allah can easily give any of you or any of us a billion times more than what he has given them. Allah's rizq is not constrained. So sometimes you might even not realize that maybe what Allah will give you is way beyond what he has given them. That's Allah's bounty. He gives it to whoever he wants. Right? So that's a very important thing that I just thought about and I really wanted to pass it across that you don't, when you listen to these amazing stories, you don't hear the success and wish for the success. We have some Muslim groups these days. They look at the fact that Allah gave the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a khilafa, right? A way of governing. And then they start to aim for a result rather than just do what the Prophet did. Allah has said, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَا يَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds, He will give them authority on earth. That's Allah's promise. So if you don't have it, you're not doing what Allah has asked you to do. Shaykh Ibrahim Niyas in his tafsir of that verse, he said, Allah has proven this many, many times. Many times. Everyone that did that, Allah gave them khilafah on earth. Okay? So please don't fall into the trap of wishing or longing or aiming for what Allah gives those who strive to Him. Just strive to Allah and Allah is Kabi. Okay? Alright. So, Nana Asmawi. Guess where we're going this time? My favorite part of Africa. Sorry, I was, I'm born in, I was born and raised in this place. Oh, not there yet. I was supposed to click on this. There we go. So we're going now to the heart of Africa, right? Nigeria is the most populous um, country in Africa. I happen to be from there, but I'm not from the north. I'm from where all the music is from at the moment. Um, so Nigeria, where we're going to. And in Nigeria, we're really talking about the north. We had a Sokoto Caliphate, and I have to decide today, tomorrow, whether I'll do the one for next week. And if I will, it will be about her father. Um, but her father is just so vast, I feel anything I say, well, even her, right? I, I feel anything I say about these people, I'm already shortchanging you guys, right? But may Allah forgive me for my shortcomings and hopefully, um, at least for our love for these people, he gives us, he make, joins us with them. The, this is Nigeria, this is the north, that's Sokoto, that's Kano, and this is now the current capital of Nigeria, that's Lagos, roughly where I'm from. And the Sokoto Caliphate, actually you can see this is um, Ibadan, that's actually where I'm from, where I was born and raised. Um, Lagos is somewhere down here. Can you see Lagos? So you can see the Sokoto Caliphate extended to all of these places, right? Huge caliphate at that time. Ilori, now, this place is now a Yoruba place. But this particular town, Ilori, is known in the southwest as a place where they say even the chickens there are scholars. Right? That's how much knowledge, you know, and all of these kind of heritage is from people like this who have, who literally spent all their life serving and teaching, right? There's a famous sheikh from this place, it's called Sheikh Adam al Ilari, wrote hundreds of books, um, hundreds of, you know, um, books on, on different topics, but that's another, actually that's a good idea for next week, but anyway, we'll see, I know some of his, I met, I sorry, I didn't meet, I 
was alive when Sheikh Adam al Lori was alive, and he was he is an amazing, amazing, amazing scholar with hundreds of, if not thousands, of students. Okay, so that's the caliphate, um, and of course, Nana Asma'u, may Allah be pleased with her, was born in Degal in northern Nigeria in the Sokoto Caliphate area in 1793. She was born to none other than Usman Dan Fudio and, her, and his first wife, Maimuna. Two years after she was born, you can see Maimuna, her mother, passes away. She was actually also um, a twin. She had a twin brother called Hassan. And normally, in how many Hassan and Husseins do you guys know? Are twins. Almost every Hassan is Hussein. And if it's a girl, then it's Husseina, right? So, but in her case, her father had an inspiration to name her Asma after Asma bin Abu Bakr. And if you read the story of Asma bin Abu Bakr, she was someone who really helped Islam a lot with service, helped with the Prophet Muhammad and bringing food to them when they were in the cave. You know, she did a lot of service. And it's said that her father had the ilham that this is what her daughter would be. Um, so much so that her father, one day, um, she, they said to him, they asked him that he should name one of his daughters a particular name, Hajar, I think it was called. And then she said, um, no, Hajar is coming, right? She said, she said, she, they said, I asked him to name one of his daughters a name, and he said, Hajar is coming. And then she had a daughter, he had a daughter, and then he gave her another name. And then he said, oh, we thought you said Hajar is coming. He said, not yet, but she's coming. That's the kind of ilham, inspiration that his father had. You know that, friends of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And Allah inspired the soul, its righteousness and its wretchedness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people who are close to him, inspires their hearts. As we said last week, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ Whoever believes in Allah, Allah will guide their heart. Right? So Sheikh, Ahmed, uh, Sheikh Usman bin Fodio was someone, uh, if I even start talking about him, then we'll end up this whole, you know, this whole session talking about him. She was, she, but she died in 1864, um, buried next to, called the Fabari, where the graveyard, not, was it even a graveyard? She, her father was buried in one of his wives' rooms, right? And she was buried, buried next to, or close to where her father is buried. Now, as you notice with the other stories, I had a picture of the people on the left, but at her time, there, wasn't, there weren't cameras. And all that you can find of her are people's drawings of her. And I didn't feel comfortable because I couldn't verify its authenticity with the amount of time I had to prepare for this session. So I didn't you know, put a picture. But what I put there is one of her poems, right? one of her acrostic poems. If you notice, can you guys see um, the first line of this poem? That's a fa, right? In, uh, in wash, the fa, they write the dot at the bottom. Okay? So in wash, they write the dot at the bottom. Okay, that's an alif, that's a noon. Okay? So fa inna, that's a mean, that's an ayn, ma'a, that's an alif. That's a lamb, ma'al, that's an ayn, sin, ra, fa inna ma'al usri, ya, sin, ra, alif maqsura, fa inna ma'al usri, yusra. I'll show you how this poem got written by her and the background by her. But this is one of the poems she wrote many, I think 60 of her, of the manuscripts that she wrote are preserved. So, let's take a brief chronology of and look at her life. So as I said, she was born in 1793, one of two. That same year that she was born, her father completed a book called Ihya al-Sunnah, the revival of the Sunnah, which is very interesting. Something is happening, you know, she, her father completes that book and such a woman who ends up being a complete servant of the Sunnah is born. Unfortunately, well, as Allah would have in like Rajun, her father, her mother passes away two years after, and as a result, she is given to one of her father's wives to take care of. Um, that father's wife is also the same mother of Muhammad Belu, 
Muhammad Bello is no he basically was a Khalifa of the of Sheikh Uthman al Fodio and he was the one that established the so-called caliphate as well after Sheikh Uthman al Fodio passed away. He was a leader, he was well known. Um, when we were younger, we used to learn some of his poems. I still have memorized one of his poems, in which at the end of each line was Allahu. Allahu li fi kulli na'ibatin aqulu fi kulli halin hasbi Allahu. Anyway, that's, and we used to sing it. I won't, I won't threaten you with um, singing that to you guys. But his, so she was raised with, by, she was raised by the mother of Muhammad Bello, which meant that he came very close as brother and sister. In 1807, surprise, surprise, she marries Muhammad Bello's closest friend, right? He died. And he was someone who had ilmul kash, the knowledge of unveiling, you know. And he was someone who was also a well-known alim, was well-known, you know, um, well-known scholar at that time. Okay, so she was around 15 when she got married to Hidado. What happened shortly after that, or some can say was before that, I've read two different um, narrations, was that her brother, um, where her brother was um, fighting a war, right? And in that war, they were being attacked by two great armies, okay? Very strong, very well-known armies. In that war, there was a particular key town, Al-Kalawa, which um, the capital of Gubir, where basically they were struggling to break this place down. And then her brother came into a room and asked, I was speaking about this whole trouble and this whole struggle, and then um, Nana Smao held a, she held a stick, a burning stick, and she said, burn Al-Kalawa, right? And fire started in that city that burns the place. This was a well-known miracle that she performed at her, when she was 15, right? That burned the place and led to the victory that they had, okay? As I said, these are gifts that Allah gives to those who strive for him. When people strive for Allah, wanting these gifts, it's a very myopic view of what Allah has. Because what Allah has is way more vast than this. These are just signs that he gives to his friends. And there are some friends he doesn't give any signs like this. Right? Doesn't mean that their position is lower with Allah. But anyway, this was well known. And then um, later on, he moved, she moves to um, Sokoto, which was a new town at that time, built by her brother, Muhammad Bello. A year after that, her first son, Abdul Qadir, she named her first son Abdul Qadir after Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, I should have mentioned, she was born into the Qadiri tariqa, into the Qadiri spiritual path. Her father was a well-known alim, Usman al Fodio, um, in that path, and she had so many scholars around her. So from a young age, you know, she started out, we'll see some of the things she did, she did um, you know, as far as our Islamic um, highlights, I would say, later on. When she was around 24, her father dies in 1817, in April, okay? That same year, her twin brother dies, Hassan. Okay, imagine the kind of blow that leads to, right? Your father, your role model, and your closest closest person to you. And any twin will tell you the closest person to them is their twin, right? So this happens to her in 1817, you know? And with that, a few years after, she gives birth to her first son, Ahmed, and wrote her first known work called Tambihul Ghafilin. Anyone that speaks Arabic here? Tambihul Ghafilin. Can you see that translation? Way of the pious. That's the translation they give to Tanbih al Ghafilin. I, I couldn't I couldn't mix that together. But I didn't have time to I read some of the I read some of the text, but I could not see how you can translate um, this the context of the book actually is explaining the way that the pious should live. But Tanbih al Ghafilin is basically a warning to heedless people. Right? It's like a alarm clock, wake up call. Right? For heedless people. So you can see that this was someone who, even with all of these disappointments, she didn't stop her work for Allah. Right? With all of these things that can easily break anyone to just not doing anything. Yet, because of her heart's connection to Allah, this didn't break 
you know, her connection with the Lord, she still continued to serve. In 1822, she wrote the acrostic poem for Inamal Osirisa, which we saw earlier. She also wrote quite a number. I've, I've had to shorten this because I wanted to limit it to two slides. I could have easily made it five slides, right? But I thought you guys would be asleep if I just went on like that. Um, she had a fourth son again in 1832, Abdullah Bayero. Um, there is a, the whole, the, a whole um, lineage of Abdullah Bayero, um, which leads to the current Emir of Kano, uh, who I know actually personally is an amazing, amazing. Was the Nigeria? He was the head of the Central Bank of Nigeria for a while, and then then he was made the Emir of. He, when he was the head of the Central Bank of Nigeria, he exposed a twenty-something billion. Um, Naira gap in the whole budget, and then he was sacked for exposing that. Then he was the Emir of Kano. Normally, have you seen the picture of an Emir of Kano? They usually cover their um, face and their mouth with a sign that they should not really meddle in political affairs. But he couldn't do that. He spoke out against child marriages, and he spoke against people rather than building mosques that should educate children instead and educate women instead. Because of that, they removed him. They first started by diluting his role as the as the emir by creating many puppet emirs, and then later on they removed him from that role. And now he is currently the um, Khalifa of the Tijaniya Qariqa in Nigeria. So something which now no government can really like touch him, but he he now leads millions of people um, in this in this spiritual path. But she um, so she named, that's her fourth son, and her position when she was around 40, was known as Uwargari, like the leader of all women. Okay, like the leader of all women. And she then later on, her son, her fifth son, um, Muhammad Laima was born. She continued writing. You can see that there's children, you know, and all of the things that entails, yet she was still writing, right? These are just a few snippets. Then. In 1837, on the 26th of October, her brother Muhammad Bello dies. Right? She wrote an, you know, um, an elegy for him. <coughs> then, about ten, about 11 years after that, her husband died when he was 74, and she wrote an elegy for him as well. And a few years after that, her son, her first son, Abdul Qadir, passes away in her lifetime. Right? Why am I made? I chose to highlight these because you know sometimes when you hear about these people. You don't take a deep dive into the kind of sorrow or the kind of heart and um, the kind of difficulties that is thrown at them. Because Allah's friends, Allah tests them with numerous difficulties, but it never wanes them, it never weakens them. All it does is that it brings them closer to Allah. You know? And of course, as you can imagine, six years after the passing of her son, she herself passes away and was buried next to our father. Right. I just thought I'd hide, bring up some specific highlights about her life. She memorized the Quran when she was 12 years old. She was fluent in four languages, very fluent, and wrote in all of these languages. One day when she was about 12, she went to her father speaking Tamashiq, and her father said, oh, where did you learn that? She said, oh, I learned it from one of my brother's concubines. Yes, they did exist at that time, just in case you're wondering. But she said, yeah, I lent it. And then her father asked her, oh, what does sun mean? She told her. What does moon mean? She told her. She said, okay. Then her father kept on asking until he said, what does salt mean? And then she said, oh, I don't know. And then she said, then father said to her, stop lying that you went to the camps of the Tuareg, and that's how you learned it there. She said, okay, yes, that's true. And then she promised her father she would never lie to him again. You know about this but that shows you from a young age around 12 her attitude to learning right that she would go to camps and sit down with all these women and just learn their language okay when she was 13 she started studying what people in universities now will study right grammar logic you know nahu mantiq ilmul balagha ta'riq tawseera shi'r Nothing. You know, she started learning all of this at Adam at 13. I already spoke about the miracle of the Battle of Al Tawa earlier. Right? And she was someone who was a polymath. She had expertise in numerous topics. She wrote on all of these topics that I mentioned. Right? And she wrote like as an as a as a as an authority 
on all of these different topics. And she was given the title, as I mentioned earlier, Uwagari, which, Uwagari, which is like the mother of all. Um, there's a similar title given to men who are like chiefs, um, but she was given the female you know, version of that because her position when she was around 40 was cemented amongst all around her. And she used to really communicate even with scholars around the, her area and all across West Africa. You know, um, So that's some part of our, some, some highlights. Islamic contribution, I found it very difficult to, to, you know, to try to summarize this, but just to mention some of the things that she did, 60 of her manuscripts are preserved, and if you get this book, right, this book costs probably less than five pounds in Nigeria, but you can't get it for less than 60 pounds on Amazon, okay? So if anyone wants to borrow it, <laughs> probably let me know. But it's it's a compilation of our works and written by John Boyd and Beverly Mack. You know, and um it's you know, so he all these manuscripts he translated them here and even if you look at the back, some of the Arabic texts, you know, are also here. But you have to be able to read and watch to be able to, to, to understand that. Also they have like texts written in Fula, right? Written with a Fula language, but written in Arabic. You have a lot of, they call it Ajani, right? So they write their own language, but they write it in Arabic, okay? So she really facilitated the education of hundreds of women. I put thousands here, but thousands by extension, right? Um, but hundreds of women. She, the biggest thing you can probably say about her legacy is what you call the Yan Taru um, legacy. What was that? She would basically have like a caravan, right? That would go from state to state. And she would look for older women. So women who their children had grown old, so they didn't, and also they weren't bound by house duties. Because in, in, the, in the society, if you were a young woman, most likely your husband would need a lot more of your time, your young children would need a lot of your time. So she would look for much older women and teach these women. Women that she knew that could travel to come to learn from her. She would also go to different places and teach these women and give them the titles as Jaji, right? And these were now the people that will be designated to go and teach others. And that legacy still exists till today, right? You have people who have unbroken chains of Jajis back to when Nana Asma founded it. And through this, loads of, loads of women and children, and she did this education not only for Muslim women, but also a lot of non-Muslim refugees that were there. She would teach all how to read, write, the Quran, Sunnah, and they had a whole proper edu um, curriculum that they would teach to educate hundreds and hundreds of women. Okay. When she was 24, I mentioned earlier, her father passed away. Without Nana Asmao and her brother Muhammad Belo, they would not, we would not have all of the works that we currently have of Shul's Mandan Podium. Some of the scholars, uh, even com com they compared what she did to what the Sahaba had to do to compile the Quran, like the kind of hard work. Um, so we thank her immensely for this. And this was only when she was 24, right? that she was doing all of this, this amazing hard work, without which, you know, really, she's really the one, the main one, of course, I, together with her brother, to be thanked for the, uh, the, the fact that we have thousands and thousands of Sheikh Usman Afodio, hundreds of Sheikh Usman Afodio's manuscripts still available to us today. Now, as the semi, the penultimate thing I wanted to show you, um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يسرى. The story behind that, which I wanted to wait until here to tell you, was in that battle, there was in one of the battles that they were struggling to, to win that battle. Her brother goes into a room with his wife and writes this poem here on the left, on the wazan of فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يسرى. In Ajami. Okay? Right, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى With fa at the beginning, it, just like she did, right? And tells his wife, 
saying, gives the wife with the wife a note and says, Don't show anyone this until Nana and Smile comes. And then the wife gives his wife, you know, she goes to see his wife, his wife gives this to her, and she composes this as a response as well. On the same wasn with the same amount of lines. You can see 14 lines each. Right? And these were in two different languages. Right? I'm not 100 percent sure. I think it's her brother's was in Arabic and she wrote hers in Ajani. Right? So in, in Fula, but written in Arabic. Right? So she basically translated and did the same. And it's a, this showed how brother and sister, you know, literally, and this, the, the, these kind of poems are written, they are using the Quran mixed with what Allah inspires them to write. To seek Allah's help. Right? Because this is based on the verse of the Quran. Where Allah guarantees victory or help in this face of difficulty. And they were facing immense difficulty with the world. Right? So you can see brother and sister coming together, running to Allah with Allah's book. And when she, she, she wrote this before they were granted victory. And after she wrote it, they were granted victory. Right? In that war. Okay? So, it's relatively short because we still need some time for... Um, this is really what I, what I, what I thought I'd, I'd mention today um, to give you. But, you know, as I said earlier, please, um, just to show you there's some... I would really encourage you guys... If you can get this um, this particular book, it's really good. As I said, this one, it's really, really good. Um, I think you can also, if, I don't know whether the um, library here would have something like this, but if, even if you can buy it, get it from the library. Um, and also, this one is a cheaper one. Um, the Caliph's sister, it's like, you know, um, autobiography of, of her life. How much was this one, if I recall? Uh, oh, I have to remove this. Uh, where is it? Okay. No. Okay. Anyway, I can't. I, I don't know how to remove this thing that I just put here. But the 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 long and short of, of what I'm saying is, you should try to try to get this if you can, um, because. Where is it? There we go. Let me click on it so that you can see. Oh no, internet. My luck. Okay. Uh, I think I actually have it on the internet. Here, did I open the page? There it is. Okay, let me show you. There it is, the Caliph sister. So it's you can get it on Kindle for a cheaper copy. Okay, and it's it's a it's a, an autobiography of her life. And the other one I was talking about earlier, this is the one. Okay. All right. As I said, it was going to be relatively short. Unfortunately, I didn't have, I had a situation where I had to go somewhere on Saturday with no prior warning until a few days before, so I didn't really have as much time to prepare for this. But I hope with the little you've heard, you have a taste of what, um, when people of Allah, who are connected to Allah, who have ikhlas, sincerity, and service, as a combination, then what Allah gives such people is priceless. And you can't really put it, you, you can't, what we've just mentioned of her legacy and all of this is just a drop in the ocean of what Allah has given to people like this. And the good news is, Allah is Hayyum. Allah is still around, right? And the door to Allah is still open. And anybody who strives and does what they've done that is, works for Allah with sincerity, Allah's bounty is vast. And Allah can more than give what he has given to these people to anyone who strives for his sake. So I hope with this, um, inshallah, it's been relatively short, but I hope, inshallah, it's given you a good, um, a good overview of the kind of life she lived, a life full of service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a life of teaching, learning, you know, learning, teaching, and complete service she really was responsible for the education of hundreds, 
if not thousands that came afterwards of women, you know, hundreds definitely during her lifetime, and then thousands and thousands that came afterwards, right? And as I said, without her, I don't think we'll have anything close to what we've been able to preserve of her father's works till today. So we ask Allah to bless her, we ask Allah to you know, raise her status with him, and we ask Allah to, by virtue of us gathering together to remember and to tell stories about what she's done, that Al-Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab, that Allah gathers us together with amazing companies like this. Right, any questions? Yes. Um, if you have the short time that you have, inshallah, to live this reasonably, as you please. Um, so my question is about, when you study these amazing people, these great people, how do you go about studying them? Because usually I find that it's very overwhelming, they've done amazing things, and it's hard to attach yourself and connect yourself to them. So how would you suggest we go about it? Especially with this schedule that we have, and the little time that we can give. Um. Do what they did. There were people, you can't tell me you were half as busy as she was, right? Um, yet, she still found time because it was important. I have a theory in life, anything that's important, you make time for. Anything that's not, you find an excuse for, right? Um, make time to, what did these people do really? We're gonna bug it down to one thing. They found time to study Islam. They had a tariqa in Iman, and they had a tariqa in Ihsan. They had the Maliki school, her, and the last two people we spoke about, Maliki school in Islam, Iman, Asharite school, and Ihsan, different schools. Her started as a Qadiri. Some scholars say that she ended up in the Tijani tariqa, although the proof for that is, is probably scant. Um, Sheikh, Ahmed Bamba for last week, a Muridi, he started with different Turuq and he ended up with his own Tariqa. Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas, you know, he also had Islam, Iman, and Islam. The point I'm saying is, all of these people had specific schools in Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, and they were sincere to those paths. And because of their sincerity, that's the key point here, that Allah knows those who are sincere. Right? Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas in defining sincerity, he said in the Quran, Allah says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ They were only commanded to worship Allah. If Allah had stopped there, everybody who worships is fine. But then what did, he say? What did Allah say afterwards? مُخْلِصِينَ Do you know what that means in Arabic? Allah could have said, يُخْلِصُونَ Which is a verb, which has a time connotation to it. Meaning sometimes sincere, sometimes not sincere, right? It has a time connotation. A verb is sometimes, you don't always do a verb. But Allah said, مُخْلِصِينَ It's a noun. Meaning you have to be permanently in a permanent state of sincerity. Because you can't do an action 70%, 90% for God and 10% for clouds and expect acceptance. Right? Allah doesn't accept that. إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ وَلَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah is pure and He doesn't accept except that which is pure. إِنَّ مَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Ibn Umar on his deathbed, they were saying to him, Ah, you followed the sunnah of the Prophet, you did this, you did that, you did that. And he responded, he said, I would actually believe you and think that I have glad tidings, if not because of one verse of the Qur'an. Where Allah says, Allah will only accept from the people of taqwa. Innama, it's only, that's the only thing that's going to happen. Innama yataqabbalullahu min al Allah will only accept from the people of taqwa. That was what scared Ibn Umar. So these people lived a life of taqwa. So if you try to do that, Allah is still there. That's the best way to emulate them. Live lives of taqwa. Learn for the sake of Allah. You don't know what Allah wants to use you for and where Allah would eventually put you. Right? I have seen people of Allah one or two days before certain things happen, they don't even know they're going to be in those places. But Allah, Allah does as He wants. 
right? So, you know, even this conversation that we're having, two months ago, did we have it in mind? Did you contact me two months ago? Right? Was it two months ago? <laughs> Four. Yeah. So, and at first, what was my response? How long did it take me to respond? I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do this. I only responded, I think, one or two weeks before the first one, right? Yeah. It was yeah. So, the point I'm saying is, with even things like this, where I'm hoping that you've all benefited, or you're all benefited, it's not things that comes just by someone's... I didn't say to him, oh, by the way, bro, I can do this. Let, you know, let me hook you up. Right? That's how it worked. Right? If someone had told me three months ago that I'll be speaking about Nana Smao, I'd be like, why? <laughs> right? And that's how things work. If you work for Allah, Allah would use you however He wants to. Even if it's just for your own self. And that's enough. But we live in a world these days where unless people see it, it doesn't count. Unless people know about it, you don't feel you've done anything. If it ain't on the gram, it doesn't exist, right? Like people say, right? So that's, and that's a real disease. It's a real killer of faith. When Allah cursed the people, of, the people who pray, what's the first thing he said about those people? Those who are neglectful of their prayers. And then what did he say? Those who love to be seen. That's social media in one word. Right? So, how do, when you hear about people like this, the, to learn about them, the best way is to try to be about them. Right? Of course. Only Allah knows whether you'll ever attain anything close to what they attained. But that's not the point. Even they themselves didn't plan to attain what they attained. They just planned to work for Allah. Her father, Usman and Fodio, never, ever had a dream of establishing a caliphate. Ever. He was attacked and he wasn't allowed to preach. That's why he thought, now we got to fight back. That's the catalyst. If they had just left him alone to pray and to preach, and to, there would not be that we know Sokoto Caliphate. Right? And so on and so forth. So the point is work for Allah and leave the rest to Allah. Allah's, you know, Allah's salary is, is priceless. But what is Allah's, what is the role of responsibility? Sincerity and service. That's it. Sincerity and service. Khalas. If you have those two, then Allah, you'll get you'll get your dues from Allah. In this world and in the next. Whether people see it or not, whether people know it or not. You know. Alright, I talked too much. Sorry. <laughs> did I answer your question actually? May yes. Allah forgive me if I didn't. Any other questions? Yes. What's the role of um, poetry? In spirituality, especially in relation to or alongside um, things like the Quran. Um, God, <laughs> you've opened a can of worms. <laughs> so, uh, um, in Arabic, the word for poetry is called sha'r. Sha'r. Same root word as shu'ur, emotion. Right? Also, the same root word as sha'r, hair. So, your hair is linked to your sensory nerve, right? And you see the way your hair comes seamlessly out of your skin. That's how emotion is seamlessly translated into words. Now think of emotions. Can you guys think of any strong emotion you've had? Any. Make it a strong one, not just, oh, I feel hungry, I feel like eating. No. Any strong emotion you've had, can you really quantify that emotion? Like, can you really, like, say, oh, it's this much? Some people are suffering years based on something that happened, an emotion that they could not contain once. Right? So, what is poetry? Poetry is taking a, either an emotion or a spiritual state or a feeling that is so strong that con some people, some scholars say that the, the ashik, right? The ashik, either, either sakata halaka. Right? The one who is in love, if he is silent, he will, he will be destroyed. 
because the love will be too overwhelming for him. And the gnostic, if he speaks, he is destroyed. Because what he knows is between him and his beloved, and he should stay that way. Right? But so with poetry, these are people who have experienced a state of being, who have lived something. And that what they've lived compels them to put it into writing. Anyone who has ever written any poetry will tell you, maybe even five minutes before, they didn't, it didn't come to their mind. And all of a sudden, there's this urge, just, all right, right, you have to write this down. Yeah, right? So it's an overflowing of emotion or of a spiritual state that someone then puts into words, that those words itself are inspired such that someone who then takes those words will have a taste of what the person who wrote it went through or the spiritual state that the person who wrote it is in so a point like Qad Kafani Ilmu Rabbi by Imam Haddad Sheikh Abdul Hakim, mashallah, may Allah bless him he likes, he sings this a lot I remember I was in a wedding once with him he was, which he was conducting and after, like, after, the, um, after the wedding after he finished the nikah I was like, all right, got to sing something. And then he started singing this together, mashallah. And, but a poem like that, قَدْ كَفَانِي عِلْمُ رَبِّي مِنْ سُؤَالِي وَاخْتِيَارِي What will push someone to say the following words? That the knowledge of my Lord suffices me from asking and choosing. Right? What kind of conviction that, does that person have of the fact that Allah knows their state? And hence, that knowledge of Allah that he's confident that exists suffices him from asking or choosing. But then what's the next step? Someone will hear that and go, Oh, but Allah asks us to make dua. So what did the Imam say afterwards? He said, but my dua. So he doesn't say that this should not make me make dua. But he said, but my dua and my brokenness with Allah is a witness of my poverty with Allah. فَلِهَذَا السِّرِّ أَدْعُوا فِي يَسَارِ وَعَسَارِ Because of these secrets, that is, I'm not making dua. When I make dua to Allah, I'm not assuming that he doesn't know my state better than I do it. I'm not assuming that he doesn't, he's not the one that chose my state for me. Hence, because of these secrets, I call to Allah in good times and bad times. It's not linked to me being in need that I call to Allah. Because it's a proof of my servitude, of my poverty with Allah. I'm a servant. That the only thing I can be proud of is in my poverty and in my neediness with Allah. So someone who reads that, even if they don't, they've never tasted tawakkud before, they go, yeah, I can do this, right? It, they, they sort of have a feel of what it feels like to be someone that totally relies on Allah, right? Like Shaykh Ibrahim said, am I going to leave Layla when there's nothing other than a Layla between me and her? Like, am I going to let anything come in between me and the Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So, if you're in Hajj or in Umrah and you don't feel that well and you read a poem like that, you're going to stand up and go. Right? You're just going to stand up. So that's what poetry does. And where did we get this from? Abdullah ibn Rawaha, in one of the battles. He was a known poet. I think it's the Battle of Tabuk. Right? When he held the flag, he was reciting a lot of poetry to sort of, you know, give him... Yeah, it's gone. He was reciting a lot of poetry to sort of urge him on. Right? The Prophet Muhammad encouraged Hassan bin Thabit to recite poetry. He said to him, recite poetry for indeed your poem, your, your, your poem is like arrows. It hurts the enemies more than arrows. Right? So poetry is really, really important. You find in almost every tasawwuf circle. There's time for poetry. This is our this is our halal wine, right? Because honestly, if only people knew what is in this poetry, they, would, they don't need alcohol to get high. That's not an exaggeration. 
There's some people that can't hack it. And you just see them go, the same thing you see drunkards do, right? They probably won't like, yeah. But anyway, not the same, they don't vomit or anything like that. But they'll scream, they'll shout, they'll, you know? They get drunk, you know, in God's love, right? So poetry is important because it, what's the point of poetry? Is to, if you really understand and you recognize, and this is also something I wanted to mention earlier, that the whole, these guys, these people that we're speaking about here, they had a genuine love for Allah and His Messenger. And as such, they achieved what they achieved. The trap I was speaking about earlier, it manifests, you see many people nowadays, you know, I might even count myself as those, whereby they have an ulterior thing they love. And Islam for them is just a means to get to that ulterior motive. And this will always become apparent later on in their lives. So it might be that fame is what they love. And they realize, okay, throw up a few of these videos, you just talk about this kind of, it'll make you famous. Or it might be that money is what they want, power, whatever it is. But they have something else other than Allah that is their true love. Right? And there's so many people like this. That, and Allah knows this. That's why you can't fool Allah. Right? True knowledge that would permeate your heart and be in light and guidance for you and others is something that's a gift from Allah that doesn't belong in a heart that has anything other than Allah. Right? So poetry is, is so important because it helps to go deep into your heart. Because it comes from deep into, from people's hearts. So it helps to go deep into your heart and try to plant in it love for Allah and His Messenger. In such a way that you are now emotionally attached to God and His Messenger. You now actually, that's what really matters most. And hence, everything that you do is really because you want Allah and His Messenger. And even if in your loving Allah and His Messenger, if you don't get to be known or famous or powerful or rich, you don't care. Because that was never in the equation in the first place. So poetry is such an important thing from the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until date in really and helping people truly taste love and plant certain things. And of course, there are many reasons. Some people, it's used for actually teaching, right? So rather than reading hundreds of books, some people will turn it, uh, some, hundreds of pages, some people will turn a, hundred, a few hundred pages into 15, 20 lines of poetry. Right? And you learn like that. So that's, Sheikh um, Ahmed Rambo did that. Okay. But when it comes to spirituality, it's so important in really, that's the main thing. Transferring spiritual states from the hearts of men of Allah and women of Allah to the hearts of seekers. And Allah is best. I hope that answered your question. Whenever I teach rhetoric, balagha, we go into this whole shi'a and like the because balagha is like the tools of shi'a, right? And we go into all of these different tools and like, oh, it's, yeah, it's a different experience. When you, you can't taste the Quran without balagha, without rhetoric, right? And once you learn rhetoric, the Quran, you know, rhetoric as a science in Islam, ilmul balagha. You know the origin of it. The origin of ilmul balagha amongst the scholars. Of creating this whole science was the debate amongst them that is the Quran inimitable or is it actually possible to imitate the Quran but Allah stops you from doing it see the difference like can you physically not create a book like the Quran or is it actually possible but anyone that tries it Allah just like you go down, go down right so they said okay to find out Let's look at, let's write down what are the things that we consider eloquent and what are the means of eloquence. And then they brought this science. And after writing all of these things down based on what they understood to be eloquent, then they said, right, based on this, now I'll read the Quran. And anyone who studies Balaba properly will come to this, not just for anyone who studies it to any serious level, will come to the same conclusion that you, this book could not have been made by a human. It's just not possible. You can't learn a science and think, 
Whoa, whoa, how did he do that? Just And this is just in one or two verses. And that's the Quran is just built. So that's why it was written. Anyone who learns the science will come to no other conclusion that the Quran was definitely, definitely not from any human. Like Walid bin Mughira came to. Sorry. You should stop me, guys. I tend to digress, unfortunately, a bit too much. Any other questions? Just enough now, right? Khalas. <laughs> Bad enough. No, but seriously, stories like this um, and people like this, you know, they are role models for us. They are the people that we should be celebrating. They are the people that all our children should know about. Um, the one of the people that helped me in, in this in this research was um, Sheikh Mendes' wife. She's currently writing another another kids book um, about um, about um, Nana Asmaul. She wrote one. I think I showed you last week about Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. You know, and these are the kind of people that we should let our kids know that, you know, because the heart naturally attracts or is attached to things that are known and famous. That's where Allah maybe, you know, our Prophet said he could have been totally obscure, but Allah know, wanted it to make it easy for us to love him. So he made him someone who is also well known, but just not in the world, also known in the heavens, right? And so on and so forth. So these people is good to teach your children and teach your which I only have to start having children and teach people you know about their lives so that it's clear to you at least in your heart that anyone who strives for Allah Allah will always provide for them and Allah never leaves them and as I said earlier there are so many other people that way even greater than the people we've mentioned so far but nobody will care about okay that's Allah's kingdom that's Allah's mood Okay. Any other questions? No. May Allah make us people who hear something and take the best of it. Allahumma ja'alna mimman yastami'una al-qawla fa yattabi'una ahsana. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shuran la ilaha ilan tastaghfiru wa atubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yashifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الرحمن الرحيم بنك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين من الله مصر إلى سيدنا محمد الفاتح المعولق والقاتل لما سبق لنصر الحق الحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومن خداره العظيم